it was like the tragic hero in literature. I took that course at the academy and that was instrumental to my thoughts too, because the tragic heroes, like all the Shakespearean heroes, all those people that are King Lear or whatever, they fall because they don't see that they're further and further into hubris. Thank you so much for tuning into Journey with Christian D. Evans Podcast. I'm your host, Christian D. Evans. And this next guest we have, she is the author of The Breaking Ice and Breaking Glass, Leading in Uncharted Waters. This next guest started out in the U.S. Coast Guard as serving on polar icebreaks, conducting national security missions from the Arctic to the Antarctic. Her 40-year career is filled with leadership lessons gleaned while breaking ice and breaking glass as the first woman to command an icebreaker on the Great Lakes and to lead a U.S. Armed Forces Servicing Academy. Along the way, this woman served the 12 years at sea, commanding two ships and led large Coast Guard organizations during times of crisis and complexity. She finished her career as the first woman assigned as Deputy Commander for Mission Support, directing one of the Coast Guard's largest enterprises. She has lectured widely on leadership all over and has been featured on C-SPAN and other major outlets. In 2012, Newsweek, The Daily Beast, named this woman to their first list of 150 women who shake the world. Please welcome my next guest, the one and only Vice Admiral Sandy Stoos. How you doing today, Sandy? Uh, very good. Thank you, Christian. Thanks for that kind introduction. <laughs> well, I am looking forward to this conversation because I love this, this breaking ice, breaking glass, leading in uncharted waters. And uh, we're going to dive into a lot of fun things about your, your journey. But one of the biggest things I found so interesting, and I wanted to just ask you, Throughout this whole journey, right, a lot of crap, it, not only were you your first woman, you obviously achieved incredible things, but throughout it, you had certain character traits, right? You had certain things that you'd never, you never not, uh, negotiated on. And so I want to ask you, Sandy, during your time, during this journey, what were those non-negotiables that you held on to, the, to everything that you had, regardless of what was thrown at you? So I think what most of us have to hold on to is our character and core values. It's who we are at the core. We can project whatever we want to project on a day-to-day -day basis, but who we are is based on our core values that we develop starting in childhood. So when I was young, I had, I, I can go into my story a little bit here, but uh, born and raised in Elka City, Maryland, I had three brothers and I was the oldest of those four kids. And my mom and dad didn't treat us kids differently. So I was treated just like the boys, which was great because I got a chance to be a tomboy. And and um, I think that really helped me later in life when I entered the Coast Guard and was one of the only women or the only woman on a, a ship or a unit. So my core values in childhood were honesty, humility, hard work, and perseverance. And I didn't know that at the time when I was a kid. But when I look back on the question you asked, what was immutable um, values that I had that, that I didn't compromise on, it would be those, my honesty and humility and the hard work and perseverance. I think those were what made my character and was the foundation on which I was able to launch uh, into my career journey. And it kept me grounded, kind of like a, well, grounded uh, and we're like a North Star where you're steering and you don't lose sight of your destination. You don't let some a uh, sway of a uh, pull of something unethical or something that you know uh, isn't really exactly right, pull you off course. So I believe that your core values and a character define who you are and the kind of leader that you're going to be. Now, let me ask you this, because I always found this very interesting, Sandy, in your journey, right? You were, I think, uh, not the first class, but the third class of the first women uh, to be in the, the Coast Guard. And I want to ask, during that frustration, that um, the, 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 the intensity, okay, of going through that, that very, very tough, um, you know, training, do you feel like that helped you? become the best leader that you are now. Oh, absolutely. That's where the hard work and perseverance comes in. And I learned that when I was a kid because I had to work really hard to earn my uh, way. I had to, I knew that I wasn't going to 
get a free college education from my parents because they didn't have the money. It was a very lower middle class family. So I worked on farm work when I was uh, just a young teenager trying to earn money for college. And as it turns out, I ended up going to the Coast Guard Academy, which was a free education. All you had to do is pay back five years of obligated service upon graduation, <laughs> which you don't think about when you're young. And, and of course, I ended up doing a lot more than that. <laughs> but the hard work and perseverance are my core values are definitely what got me through the Coast Guard Academy. The hard work that we did there really showed me that uh, if I could make it there and a lot of the um, the, the difficulty that you experience in a training environment is imposed to create a stressful situation so that you, when you get out into the actual Coast Guard and you're trying to save somebody's life or in an icebreaker down in Antarctica, uh, you're going to be performing at your best. You're going to have been there before with the stress. So you condition yourself to different levels of stress uh, and and hard work and and uncertainty when you're in a training environment and then you're prepared to perform when it's a real life situation. When you were going through this, not only because you're a woman, but you also had these non-negotiables, these core values, which uh, you you mentioned throughout your book. Do you were you ever in a time? Because in the military, it is that chain of command. Whatever that individual, that that uh, presiding officer says, you have to do, right? Uh, because obviously that helps kind of really systemize the and streamline really just uh, being able to accomplish the mission, right? The mission is above everything else. And so I'm curious, Sandy, were you ever in a situation, and maybe you don't have to mention names or whatever, in a situation where you had to be, um, you had to maybe say, hey, this is, this is going against my non-negotiable, right? And mm -hmm. you had to have a choice and you were in that situation. That's a really good question. And first of all, in the Coast Guard, you if you stay in long enough, you hear this little phrase, if it's not illegal, immoral, or unethical, and it's an order from your supervisor, you've got to do it. Of course, there is then that gray area of what's illegal, unethical, or immoral. <laughs> And it was interesting. I was on a Coast Guard cutter in one of the leadership positions, but not the top leadership position. And I happened to pick up to read on a patrol, a book called The Cane Mutiny. <laughs> and some of your readers won't know that book, but it's a, a book by Herman Woke. And it's a book that had a really famous courtroom scene that was made into a movie. And the executive officer, the second in command on this warship during World War II, um, led, relieved the captain of the ship, who is the equivalent of the CEO in a company in the private sector, relieved that person um, as captain uh, because he didn't think the captain was doing the right things. They were not ethical or moral. Um, um, I'm not sure about the legality part, but it was very interesting because the whole courtroom drama focuses on did the XO have the uh, authority to relieve the captain of his duties, um, which is akin to mutiny, sort of? And it was very, very interesting because you could argue it both ways. You could argue, should you just shut up and do what you're told? Or should you take those really bold steps that are going to be questioned and the spotlight is shining on you? And you're going to have to demonstrate moral courage to do the right thing. So I personally believe that you should um, demonstrate the moral courage to do the right thing, to speak up against something that's going on, but it's hard. And I'll tell you, when I was that that um, in that leadership position on the ship, to go back to the story, our, we had a captain who was the commanding officer of the ship who would always be seeing how close to the edge he could get on decisions involving the ship and the crew. And there would be um, going into a, a port call um, on December 31st and staying overnight till January 1st. And the port call would be a foreign country where there was, um, uh, you get special duty pay because it was a little more dangerous to go there. And all we're doing is going in for a liberty call on the ship uh, in the Caribbean. And he would get then the crew two months of, um, of hazardous duty pay because we moored up for liberty <laughs> to rest the ship for December 31st and January 1st. So I, that just wrangled me because, yeah, it's just the taxpayer's money and it's not illegal and it's probably not even immoral 
Is it ethical? It's nothing, there's no laws against it, but it's gaming the system. So I'm kind of getting into the gray area here on whether you speak up because how how close to unethical is is it gaming the system? How much gray area do you tolerate? And if you tolerate this kind of a gray area where you're trying to milk what you can out of the 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 the, the government pay system, even though it's not illegal, is it really the right thing to do? And if you accept that that's the right thing to do, then you've just redrawn the line in the sand or drawn yourself a line in the sand, and it makes it easy to step over that line and go to the next level of what is a little bit closer to being unethical, illegal, or immoral. And then once, if no one says anything, so if no one has the moral courage to raise their hand and speak out, either tell you that they are not comfortable with that or tell the a superior somewhere, then the line gets drawn somewhere else. And we saw that kind of on the ship as this captain, and it's kind of like a little joke in the surface forces is that being at sea, command to sea is the last bastion of totalitarianism <laughs> anywhere because you have a lot of authority. You have a lot of responsibility, but you have a lot of authority and not much oversight when you're out to sea. So a leader can really start taking it to the next level if there's not checks and balances with people in the crew who need to speak up and say something. So I know this is um, going, kind of going a little bit all over the place. I hadn't thought this out in advance, but there's some thoughts maybe there for what you should do to make sure that when you get an order, you're doing the right thing, either following it or speaking up. And it's not easy. There's a gray area. It's very difficult. And that's what leaders are, are paid to do is navigate that gray area. Well, see, Sandy, I'm so glad you're bringing this up. And it is a very tough conversation because I think it's interesting. We love to talk about the positives of leadership and the culture and all that fun stuff. But like you, Mitch, I think it's the, the, the gray area, it's the nastiness. And the reason why I'm saying this is because obviously we have seen, you know, Sandy, um, um, uh, Sam uh, Bankman fried right now, huge billion dollar scam, even bigger than Bernie Madoff. And it's not just by happen chance or coincidence that all of a sudden all that money's gone. It is, it is, and it wasn't just Sam's fault. It was everybody else right below him as well saw this happening. And there you're guilty by association as well. And I think you bring up a really good point because there is a company where, hey, he is your commanding officer. He or she is your commanding officer, but also you as the individual mid-tier leadership or whatever, even in business world, you have to have that conversation. And that's why I think it's so interesting about really how you emphasize core values to such an extreme saying, hey, you know what? Is this aligning with my core values? Do I feel weird after doing this X, Y, Z? Then this is not aligning. And then obviously you're going to have you know shame and guilt down the future if you don't speak up. Now, I want to ask you, Sandy, during your journey, how did you identify your core values? Because I, I found it very interesting. You were very intentional with putting those out and making sure that you're very aware of that. What was that process look like for you? So the process of uh, kind of internalizing my core values and then being able to project them and maybe help share them with other people <laughs> wasn't like a rising up from nowhere. It, it started in childhood when my parents, my teachers, my coaches all instilled in me these characteristics of honesty and humility by not tolerating a lie. And most kids are caught in a little white lie somewhere. And um, that happened to me. And I was so embarrassed when I was caught in it. I didn't want ever to feel that way again. And uh, in humility, my, my parents, my coaches, you know, if you did kind of well at something, they always kind of helped you to understand that, be modest, be humble, because uh, that's what is the right thing to do, not lord it over or celebrate, over celebrate when you win in a sport. So I learned to be um, humble uh, that way. And I think that is, the, I, you know, looking back, I think that humility is the most important characteristic in a leader. And I know people, anybody who asks what's the most important trait of a leader is going to have a different answer, which is great. That's real diversity. But to me, it's humility. So, and I already talked about hard work and perseverance. Now, when I was a young child or a teenager, I didn't know that my core values were honesty and humility and hard work and perseverance. It was only um, 
you know, Christian, maybe 10, 10 or 15 years into my career, when I started getting senior enough to where instead of me asking other people their advice and looking to be mentored, I was the one that people were asking to mentor them and asking my advice and Miss Stowe's or Commander Stowe's, how did you succeed? And I had to give it some thought and I focused back on, okay, the Coast Guard has three core values, honor, respect, and devotion to duty. And I'm like, okay, so I obviously have core values, but do I really uh, let people know what they are? And sure, you uh, model the way and people are going to see you and see what you do and how you believe and follow that. But I wanted to um, have something more tangible to talk about. So I said, okay, what is it that I think made me successful that started out in childhood? And I look back and I came up with those four core values. And it really helped me to be a better leader, to be a better mentor. So that when people ask me, ma'am, how did you succeed? I can say, you know, I, when I was a child, when I was younger, here's what happened to me. And here's some of the things I learned from that. And I realized those are my, the core values that I carry with me that were instilled institutionalized in me early on. So that helps me to be a better leader. And, you know, being a leader is all about being a teacher and a mentor and leading is the one side of that coin. But if you're just leading, projecting outward to do the right thing for your company, you're not looking at the other side, which is teaching and mentoring your people, then you're not a full leader. So I think there's two sides of that coin is success of the company and success of the people. Let me ask you this, because you mentioned humility, hard work, and perseverance. I want to dive into humility a little bit. During your journey, did you ever struggle with that pride and arrogance coming and slowly dwindling or sprinkling into your life that prevented you from growth because you lacked humility? Or did you always say, okay, I'm going to prioritize humility at everything? Or was there a point in your journey where it's like, okay, you started seeing pride and arrogance and you started gloating mm. and, and stuff like that during your, during your journey? Oh, that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked that because I like to talk about humility. So I was lucky sometimes being good or successful in life is partly your hard work and perseverance, but there's a lot of chance and circumstance, luck, God's will, whatever it might be. And I was lucky um, to be born an introvert. So I tended to be more quiet. I um, love this book by Susan Cain called Quiet. And in there, she talks about um, research where it shows that Introverts uh, can be less stimulated by material possessions or or uh, manifestations of power and, and stuff that can drag somebody into that hubris, which is the opposite of humility. I never had that, but I also um, didn't want to take any chances because I did from a very young age in the Coast Guard as a junior officer see that whoever fell, got in trouble, um, had to be relieved for cause uh, from their command. They, it was like the tragic hero in literature. I took that course at the academy and that was instrumental to my thoughts too because the tragic heroes, like all the Shakespearean heroes, all those people that are King Lear or whatever, they fall because they don't see that they're further and further into hubris and they've lost their humility and they don't notice that that they're gonna fail because it catches up with them. So I wanted to avoid the tragic hero in literature. I started seeing commanding officers of ships relieved for cause for doing stupid things, like having um, an inappropriate relationship with a young officer, young female officer. If they were like a 40 year old captain, here they are a brand new junior officer comes aboard and they're gonna have an affair with that person. Just, you know, what are you thinking? And it's like, you know, I risen up to this high and I I earned this or deserve this or I don't even think about it. The hubris just takes over. So I didn't want to um, ever allow myself to um, to fall away from being humble. And because it's kind of like pain. If you uh, go to the dentist and they pull a tooth, they'll often give you a little bit of um, like Tylenol and say, take it because it's easier to not get the pain than to get a big toothache or headache and then have to try to manage it down. I'm like, I don't want to ever become a person that's not humble. So throughout my career, I tried to like, like, um, like right now I drive a 1999 Ford Escort. And I'm very proud of that because 
<laughs> it makes me feel like I'm staying grounded. Like I don't need manifestations of um, power to demonstrate who I am. I, I just I do little things like that to make myself always remember, hey, you are just a regular person like everybody else. You've been in the Coast Guard a long time and you've gotten some rank, but rank's not everything. And in fact, um, if you'll allow me to have one little more vignette, <laughs> when I was an ensign, and another thing that ties into all this is I'm, on, I'm an ensign, I'm on an icebreaker going to Antarctica for five months. So I am brand new, my first job out of the Coast Guard Academy. And I report aboard the ship. I'm one of a few women in a crew of 220, and I'm in charge of a work detail one night. And it's not even um, people under my normal command. It's people who have misbehaved and they're on punishment detail. <laughs> And it was really hard to get this one guy to do anything. And I'm like, he's not listening to me. So I go to my boss and I say, hey, hey, Lieutenant Thompson, uh, this guy is not doing what I ask him or tell him to do. What, do you have any advice for me? And he looked at me and he said, Sandy, if you're gonna succeed in the Coast Guard, you gotta know there's three kinds of power. There's personal power, professional power and position power. And if you're going to be successful, you need to lean on the first two, your personal power, your professional power, and go only to the position power when it's really necessary. And that means that you need to spend every day building trust and earning respect with the people you work with. So you need to go down and find out what makes that fireman tick and try to relate to that person and make that person want to serve you, to want to follow you, not to follow you because you come down with a stick because you're an ensign and he's only a fireman, you know, the lowest level, which is what the case was. <laughs> so um, I never forgot that. And it became another little thing I could teach people with that three P's of power. And it's, I feel like that whole thing I just told you, that whole story has been a, um, a life's effort to remain humble so that I could relate to people to meet them where they are and to help bring them up to the place where I wanted them to be. And I can't be that person if I'm stuck on hubris and way up here and I can't relate to anybody else. Sandy, I really appreciate you emphasizing that. And I'm so glad we're talking about this because I see this, you know, like you mentioned, it's, it's easy to get to the top, but it's hard to stay at the top. And then also to exit the top successfully, right? Whether you're uh, a vice admiral, for example, and being able to obviously exit um, with, with distinguish um, uh, and honorable. And it's, it's so interesting, you see so many, sadly, uh, whether that's in the military, whether that's corporate, whether that's, you know, in, in a personal life. And like you mentioned, that one key aspect is that humility. And because uh, I was going to ask what checks or balances, what systems to prevent yourself. And the number one thing is you don't have to do that if you stay humble and always know that you stay grounded. I love that. Now, I want to talk a little bit about your perseverance. Okay. And Sandy, I find this always interesting because I've talked to a lot of people. Sometimes you are non-negotiable with the end result, but you're negotiable with the path. And so with your perseverance, I would imagine life just, you know, I mean, definitely from when you first started to getting accepted, to going through the process, to getting, you know, um, going through the officer ranks, et cetera. What, where did you have to, where perseverance, where you had to persevere but also had to persevere and maybe adjust paths, right? In the, in the proper way. And I wanted to just get your response on that because I think it is, it is good to be perseverant toward a goal, but then also be flexible with the path. Or will you say, no, I'm going this way 100% regardless of what is being thrown at me? I'm curious what your response is, Sandy. My thoughts on that are that the journey of life is difficult and Anybody who thinks they've got one, one way to get there, I'm a little bit suspicious probably. And they're I mean, not suspicious in a bad way, but I'm seeing naivety and I'm seeing young people sometimes who are like, okay, I know exactly what I'm going to be doing. And I'm like, yeah, I'm glad you're enthusiastic, but, <laughs> and I don't need to tell them, hey, be open-minded because you know, you're likely to have doors open and close and, and sometimes slam in your face and have to take another way around. They'll learn that on their own. But no, you don't have a straight course to an end result. There's going to be, um, it's like a ship going down a channel. You um, set the helm in one position and the currents, the wind, the waves is going to set you off course and you're going to crash into the break walls on each side if you don't keep on adjusting your helm, right? So it's obvious to me that you got to keep adjusting your course, but it's not easy because 
people want to persevere and they don't want, and I encourage young people, hard work won't get you, but so far, if you um, run up against the first obstacle and you quit or back off and decide this isn't right for me because I've got resistance here, then, and you don't persevere, you're going to fail. Um, so sometimes you have to just make sure that you're going around that iceberg and finding a new path, uh, a new way to get to where you're going. So you might know that you want to um, be a, a cutterman in the Coast Guard, which is what I did, and serve on ships at sea. But at first you go out there and you're having a hard time qualifying, which what happened to me, I couldn't get qualified um, on my first ship for a while because it's another story. If I had quit, I never would have gotten to be a Coast Guard cutterman and maybe never gotten to be a Coast Guard admiral. Um, so I persevered in addition to working hard and doing everything I could to get qualified and to get to my goal. But I certainly went um, and had different paths. And the assignment officers made sure I had plenty of chance to change direction because in the Coast Guard, you get assigned to different jobs every two to three years. And you don't have like a set path up. They're going to send you to um, a short job over here to broaden you, so to speak. Then you get to come back to see. Then you go to some other job over here. So I, I know that's a little unique to the military, but I think people should open their minds about uh, looking at kind of a general destination of where they want to go, but also realize that there's going to be things that change along their life's journey, um, personal factors that come into play that like marriage or children, whatever it might be, you move or your elderly parents to take care of. So the perseverance is an interesting word because I love it to have the pairing of hard work and perseverance, but I always get asked by somebody in the audience who's actually listening and, and thinking, they say, well, ma'am, sometimes, you know, perseverance, you just push in a bad, a bad outcome, you know, when do you quit? How do you know when the time is right to quit and really try a different tact and not just keep on persevering because Admiral Stowe's told you you should? <laughs> and that would never, of course, been my intent. But when do you realize that you've gone as far as you're going to go in one area and then you need or want a change and you've got to deliberately make that choice to turn? And that happened to me in my career. I was um, a cutterman uh, going to sea, serving on ships that I'd always wanted to be. I've been 12 years at sea. I just come off a command of a ship. I'd gone to a, um, a shore assignment. Um, and then I was getting ready to go back. And the next last step in my afloat career at the, you know, more senior level was going to be this biggest ship the Coast Guard has, which is like a frigate sized ship. And it was just assumed that I would do that. And everybody wanted me to, because it'd be another woman commanding a big ship. And there's not many women at sea. But something was inside me saying, I, wow, I, I've been at sea my whole career. And I just feel like there's something else I'm being called to do. And I had to give it some thought because I wasn't sure what that was. I just started out by knowing that I didn't think I wanted to stay at sea anymore. It's not because I didn't like it. So that was kind of crazy because I like being at sea. But I started thinking, what is it that I love about being at sea? Is it the sunsets? You know, is it the adventure and the excitement of the missions? We do search and rescue. We do law enforcement. We do uh, marine environmental protection. Great missions in the Coast Guard. Nope, none of that. It was the people. So it was receiving a brand new recruit from boot camp. And that person comes on board. And they usually start out by coming on board. And and uh, the ship is at, in the in port. And there's a, an end of the ship they're supposed to salute where the national ensign is, it's the stern of the ship. And there's a little Union Jack on the bow of the ship and there's two flags and they're supposed to salute one. They salute the wrong flag and they get greeted with a, um, an angry, you know, roar from the person they're reporting into and they tell them, here's how you're supposed to do it. But then you see the same young person two weeks later, and now they're hauling on a line and they're singing out with confidence. And you're like, wow, this young person's gone from an unconfident person who reports in, makes a mistake right off the bat, fails. But now look at them. They're succeeding in little ways and growing as a leader and as a person. And they are becoming fulfilled as an individual and as a member of this team on a ship. I'm like, wow. <laughs> That is what life is all about. It's about the people and the leader development. So I asked, I told the people that were wanting to screen me for command of a ship. I wrote a letter saying, please don't screen me, which was hard. And I cried when I wrote the letter 
But then I asked, will you please assign me to lead the Coast Guard's boot camp, which was open that year. It's a four-year job, so it's not open that often. It was like providential. And amazingly, I was assigned to lead Coast Guard boot camp. It's Coast Guard Training Center in Cape May, New Jersey. And I found my calling. And from there, I went on to lead the Coast Guard Reserve Force and then to lead the Coast Guard Academy as superintendent. So in the um, senior two-thirds of my career, excuse me, senior one-third of my career, after I finished like two-thirds of my career, I had this feeling I had something else, a calling that I needed to pursue. So I kept, I stopped persevering in my Cutterman afloat to command the biggest ship the Coast Guard had and redirected to go over and put my efforts where I thought I had a calling in developing leaders from the most junior stages up. Yeah, I love that approach. And I love that methodology of the way you think, right? Your perspective on the way you think about perseverance, right? And sometimes there are, uh, there, there is a time frame with this, you know, project and there's a time frame for this project and you got to know what, uh, what point that is. And you got, like you mentioned, cut ties while you're ahead and say, okay, now my job is to add value to those that are coming up and raising the next generation of leaders uh, in, in the Coast Guard. I want to talk a little bit about um, definitely being out on sea or even you know, with, with your stationary uh, positions, right? Um, you were, were fully accountable, right? You were, and, and definitely when, when things go well, you, you give credit to the team. When things go bad, whatever the project may be, not hitting those metrics, whatever it is, a mission, there are certain times as a leader where you have to have those, those tough decisions. And sometimes you don't have all the data. Right. But like you mentioned, there is a there's a time frame and you have to make that decision within that time frame. Right. Whether it's on sea and you're in a mission and you don't have that enough data. And I think it's so it's such a good example where sometimes that may or may not be the right answer. But at the end of the day, it's you're accountable and you take ownership of that decision, whatever it is. And so I'm curious, Sandy, throughout your journey, you could probably think of a few, imagine a few where you're in that situation and OK, Looking back in those situations, what would you have rather have done differently? Maybe getting more information, maybe extending the timeline, maybe whatever it is, what would you have done differently in those circumstances that produced a bad outcome? Or obviously saying, okay, hey, this was a really good outcome. And what did you do in those circumstances that said, okay, we don't have much data. I got to make a decision. And this mm. is what the outcome of that decision. Thanks for the question on decision-making. Just as I think that Humility is the most important characteristic of an individual leader. I think that decision making uh, is one of the most important things that a leader does. And there's all kinds of things that a leader does too. Uh, decision making. <laughs> so, uh, man, as I got more senior in the Coast Guard, I got more and more frustrated working for leaders who just couldn't seem to make a decision. And these were people who have been trained to make decisions, but they would the inbox would get higher and higher, and they'd send something back three times to take an A and make it a, a B. And I started to become very frustrated. Then I went to graduate school and I kept saying, if I ever get senior, I'm gonna just make decisions, which of course decision-making is hard. And you wanna find a balance between being rash and then being too um, um, adverse. There's gonna be a balance in there somewhere. So I went to graduate school at the Kellogg Business School when I was a Lieutenant, Lieutenant Commander. And I, <laughs> academics come hard to me and business school is hard when you're talking about financial decisions and all this stuff. But I found this marginal cost curve that I loved, not because of anything to do with costing out products, product development, but you take the marginal cost curve and you put a lot into a product development all the way up until you get to like to the 85, 90%, whatever it might be, 95, depending on the product of reliability or whatever it is. And then you just say, okay, this is the product. It's, it's launching. And it's not 100% reliable, accurate, perfect, but it's where it is, any more money you put in to get that extra four, three, two, one percent of value will be a money that um, gets you nowhere because you just can't really get any more value out of it. So the same thing, I thought, wow, I can use that for decision making because you get to like the 80, 85% on information you've got in, stuff you can see in your environment that will help you make a decision. And you're never going to have 100% of the information you want. And as George Patton said in World War II, a good decision made today, when it matters, is 10 times more superior than a perfect decision made two weeks from now when 
it's no irrelevant. And I, I never forgot that quote. Of course, I embellished it a little bit. <laughs> and I'm like, you got to make decisions if you're a leader now, timely decisions, good decisions, fact based. Yes. But um, I, I, I came up with three impediments to decision making. One was the per, uh, paralysis by analysis, where people just can't make the decision because they want a little bit more info and they keep waiting. Then you got the consensus conundrum where people just can't make the decision because not everybody in the room agrees. Well, by the time the decision gets up to you as a more senior leader, there are going to be a lot of people who don't agree. It's not an easy decision anymore. There's tough trade-off decisions you got to make that have consequences on people and programs. And then there's the being nice illusion. And it kills me when you see all these things nowadays in the leadership space about just be nice, just be nice. And I'm like, well, but don't be walked all over. And a lot of times I've seen nice people just walked all over by the few people who are looking to do that. Then the majority of people are watching all this and their morale is in the dumps because the decision maker is letting somebody who's, um, you know, just out there trying to, you know, they're too nice to make a decision that will hurt somebody. So they don't make a decision. They put it off. So the tough decisions that I've had that I wish I could have had another retake on didn't always rise to the level of all three of those impediments. And I've always been a pretty good decision maker because I had that experience of not wanting to keep my people on the spot. But I did a blog just a couple of weeks ago on when I was a lieutenant and I was on a ship. So I was on the Cat My Bay, an icebreaker up in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, way up near Canada. So the only thing separating Canada from Sault Ste. Marie is the St. Mary's River. And it's just downstream from the Sault Ste. Marie Locks, which is um, the, 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 it's like the Panama Canal. It's a lock that takes uh, the water from a, a lake, Lake Superior, that's higher, and you have to go down to a river. And so a ship will ride down on that lock and then come out and go down the river. And these thousand foot long uh, iron ore carriers come out of that lock and come down the St. Mary's River and it's an all day trip. So my little little icebreaker was wanting to get underway that morning and get out down the St. Mary's River and be working on a little bit of ice breaking and stuff like that. And uh, I could see this big thousand foot, you know, 800, uh, some huge amount of tons. I can't remember how many tons it was now coming out of that lock and getting momentum on kind of like a Mack truck coming down a highway, just getting up speed. <laughs> and I said, well, we can get underway and get down that river. If we get behind this guy, we'll never get down to get our mission done. So I'm like, let's go guys. We're going to get the ship underway. And we'd gotten the ship underway a million times before and proverbially. <laughs> and so we take in all lines and we spring and we get up the ship underway, right. in, you know, not right in front of the ship, but close enough to where I'm thinking to myself, I, I made a bad decision and now I can't undo it. I can't go back to the pier, but now I'm taking my ship, turning a broadside, getting in front of this guy to go down river. Cause you can't pass anyone on the river. It's just, they take up the whole river, these big ships. And I'm like, yeah, but what if anything went wrong? The ship could hit us and um, create a catastrophic outcome, but I couldn't go back on that decision. But in the Coast Guard, we have a process um, that is reflecting back. So whenever we um, get done with an evolution, we do a hot wash and we sit down and we talk about what we could have done better, what you don't want to do again next time. And those are the kind of things that help a decision maker like me who wished I could have had a redo and I couldn't have a redo at that time, but I get the ship underway almost every day. I can have a redo tomorrow. So I'm going to hot wash what I did, the actions that we all took, find where the errors were, even if the captain is the one making the error. And sometimes it's not the captain, it's somebody else down the road in the engine room or something. And then you have uh, a template so that you can not make the mistake the next time you do it. And you have checklists to make sure that you incorporate the lessons learned. So there's a lot of tools that leaders can make can use to make sure they make good decisions. And if they need to change a course, they can maybe not, maybe it's too late right now, but you can change course in the future as a leader and become a better leader over time. 
what an interesting story. And I love, I appreciate being authentic and sharing that and realizing, okay. And, and I think it's so many of us, we, we've definitely a lot of my audience and myself where we made a decision. And then, like you mentioned, we we're like, oh crap, you get that kind of gut feeling like, I don't know if this was the right thing, but now I can't do anything. I got to go all the way in and we got to go down this path, whatever it may be, whether it's a project, whether it's, you know, allocating X amount of resources or hiring someone or whatever it may be, you know, in, in, in business world. But I think that's a really appropriate, you know, kind of response. And I, I've heard a lot of uh, military members do a hot wash where they're analyzing. So Sandy, I hope us unpack that a little bit, because I think I love that concept. And I don't see myself doing it in personal life, but also I don't see it in business that we could do that to the next level. So what questions do you do on a good or a bad decision? Um, and who's all involved? And how does the environment work? Is it just simple five quick questions, understanding, okay, hey, how can we adjust this, blah, blah, blah? Or is it more of an hour, hour and a half, kind of, okay, what happened? This is what we're going to do next time, et cetera. Uh, I love to understand and unpack that, because I think there's a lot of, lot of gold nuggets there there are and i think that i'll put a plug in for veterans because the military whatever branch the coast guard's one of five or six depending on space force they're out there now <laughs> um we all have these procedures that are honed over time because we are on the front end of missions where life and death is at stake and more than that the nation's wars. Uh, so you can't, there's some things you just don't want to get wrong. I mean, everybody makes mistakes as failures are part of life, but you can't, you need to moderate and do the best you can. So I think um, people in the civilian sector, be it the public and private nonprofit sector can learn from the, those on the pointy end of the spear in the armed forces. So veterans bring this incredible leadership package to a job. And a lot of people don't see that they see what they've been told that they hear on the news, PTSD or something, whatever. No, veterans are um, have superpowers and it's all about leadership, diversity. They're working with people from all around the country, all over the world. When they come to boot camp, they learn how to lead others, to work as a team, to, um, to recognize the three different kinds of diversity, what you look like, but also where you're from and how you think. So there's all this... Um, um, gold that you can get in a veteran. And so the reason we get to have those qualities of leadership is because we do things systemically across the service to make sure that we are standardized so that we don't make mistakes that we don't have to make. And that if we do, we can fix them. So a typical hot wash situation happens after an evolution that could be getting underway. It can be um, in the army getting ready for a patrol into the you know, out in um, Afghanistan or something. Um, it can be getting ready to take a fighter pilot, a fighter jet up. You have a, a checklist first that you go through before you start the evolution. And it, everybody on the ship, in my case, um, or in the cockpit of an aircraft, um, has a part to do in that checklist. And uh, more so certainly on a ship than, than in a two-person aircraft, maybe. But um you go down and you make sure that everything is checked off that you're supposed to do. So it takes away the possibility you're going to make the error of a mission of forgetting something. And then what you do is you gather everybody around who's involved in the evolution. And say you have a ship of 75 people, you may be having 15 of those that are up there on the bridge or wherever you're gathered to talk about the evolution. And you're going to have a brief given at this, at this um, pre-deployment brief. And you're going to have maybe the operations officer explain to brief the captain, the crew, the, the engineer, all the key people are there. Here's what we're going to do on this evolution. Here's what we, how we intend to do it. Because there's a lot of ways you can get a ship underway, for instance. Here's the winds. Here's the traffic in the harbor. Here's what's um, going on. Um, here's how we're going to get the ship underway. Here's the considerations we have to make. Here's the tides and currents. So everybody knows what the plan is. So it's not just a person up on the bridge who decides, here's how I'm getting the ship underway today. And people are like, what are they doing? So this gets everyone aligned towards the common goal of getting the ship safely underway out onto its mission. And you can see where that could be the same thing for a, a, a company, an organization. And then you go out and you do the evolution and sometimes things go really, really well. And there's like, oh, okay, that's great. But oftentimes there's something somewhere that you could do better next time. Even if it's not a failure, even if it's just, oh, 
yeah, let's up let's up our game on this and we can improve this aspect of what we do getting underway. And then you get underway, you do the evolution. And when you have a break, maybe come back in at the end of the day and you hot wash what happened. The same people meet. So it's a section of the crew that involves most of the leadership that can then go back down and brief their people. And you go through all that went well so that you can repeat that and you give kudos to those who did a good job. It's a great way to publicly recognize somebody. And then the things that didn't go so well, people, it's a um, no fault environment. Like um, I know they call it safe spaces now. I kind of don't like that word because I'm not so sure. Having been in the military and stuff, I'm not sure so, so sure that the enemy respects or mother nature respects um, want to have a psychologically safe space. Never happened to me. I've been terrified at sea. Mother nature didn't give me any safe space when I was leading ships in storm force storms. But um, you have, though, a no-fault environment where everybody wants to know what went wrong so that we can, we're all in this ship together. If we don't get it right, we're all going to sink and die together. So we depend on each other. And I think that the co and interdependency makes it so you don't need to say, I've got a safe space here. I think people cultivate that they realize that you're all in this together a good captain will make sure that they project that expectation a good captain will reach out and ask the most junior guy what do you think so that person feels empowered to say something even if they're too shy uh to raise their hand and make the comment and then people get used to that oh the captain she's asking people their opinion oh i guess i feel confident to raise my hand now so you kind of create that culture where you have these evolutions, these hot washes, and you are a team who knows that you're all interdependent and you're only as good as what everybody has to bring to the table. It's such an interesting conversation to have. And really, I'd love to dive in into that even further. But I want to ask you a few more questions here because I've been in a situation in the military where I was at a different, uh, at an at a active base. And there was a lieutenant, and then he had his commanding officer in there. And he was doing the presentation. And there were a lot of the enlisted in there. And we were all having a conversation. And one of the enlisted, which was a higher ranking enlist, I think senior master, he called out the lieutenant. Well, obviously, that was a little bit of pride, right? there and the lieutenant didn't like that and of course the commanding officer was like oh but it really didn't matter but it was the interpretation of that environment and of course later on it got a little heated etc and you could just tell mainly it was um, first of all, there was a lack of humility in there. And I think that's why I love your conversation and really, you know, foot stomping on that, because if there was humility, then there would have been open interpretation like, yeah, you know what, you're correct enlisted member, boom, and they would have moved on because at the end of the day, it's not about me, you or them. It's about the mission and making sure, hey, are we getting all of our, you know, like, you know, Sandy, I, I don't know how many people were aboard your ship, but I would imagine several thousand people. But it's your responsibility to bring them all home, right, and safe and, and right. secure and 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 one piece. And obviously, that's that's a lot. And every decision you are influencing and impacting every single one of them. And uh, I, I just I think that's just uh, really really quite incredible. I want to ask you this as well because um, we talk a little bit about this before this podcast, and I'm really excited about having this conversation because. The we all again leaders they we love to talk in this ecosystem of hey I'm a leader I'm a CEO yay you know and the culture and you know I'm the energy but you also have to have those tough conversations whether it's saying hey you know what Jeffrey you're not performing to the level that I know you can perform or you're not doing X Y Z or hey you know I'm disappointed because these are our non negotiables these are our core values here in this ecosystem and you didn't follow through. You drank, you did something that was incorrect, and now I got to do some repercussion, right? And having those tough conversations, but in a delicate way, but also telling them, hey, this is my standard, this is my expectation, and not, and, and not being, you know, negotiating with that. So I want to ask you, what, how do you go about having those tough conversations, those tough dialogue, and then making sure that there is that follow through, there's that action for that individual to make sure that they are raising to that expectation that you set? Thank you for that question. I love having those tough conversations. And once again, it's because coming up as a more junior person, I looked up and not just did I see leaders not making decisions, but I saw them not making, well, not making decisions on taking someone to task who wasn't performing. So generally speaking in a workplace, you'll have most people, I'll just speak for the Coast Guard, most people 
energetic, eager, want to do a good job. But there's always that, I don't know how many percent, five, let's call it 5%, who just aren't. And, uh, and yet they, if they're not held accountable, they'll do less and less and less. And what do they call it now? Quiet quitting or something. They'll just sit there. And, and if they know the boss is not going to say anything because the boss has got the being nice syndrome or whatever, like my um, decision-making uh, uh, impediments. So I always liked to be that boss that came in, analyzed the laydown of what the workforce was capable of and doing and uh, making sure that everybody was carrying their weight. Because um, if you look at the... Uh, federal um, employee surveys. There's uh, these surveys that they do in government um, every year and the Coast Guard has to participate. The top factor most years of discontent amongst federal government employees is that everybody's rewarded the same. Nobody is given more praise or, or cash bonuses because they do extra better and nor are the people that aren't doing anything held accountable. They're just Everyone is the same. That's why I'm not a fan of this um, equality, equal outcomes, because people perform at different levels and they, the morale just stagnates. If you, if you have a leader come in and can't look somebody in the eye and say, hey, you either misbehaved or you misperformed. And here's what you need to do to correct that. And here's a plan. So to get more specific to you, a leader needs to identify a problem when they see one and they will see it. And they can't just turn a blind eye and hope the problem goes away. Oh, no, those people causing those problems, that's exactly what they're expecting. And they, they thrive in that space of a leader who turns a blind eye. So you've got to have an honest conversation. You don't call the person in and start saying, yeah, you're, you did this great. I appreciate what you did last week. You, you tell them all the good things. And then you're like, oh, but, 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 but I'm putting you on performance probation because you're not doing well. So I hate it when someone comes in and they want to counsel you on how great you're doing, but then they drop the bomb on you. And they're, you're really being called in there because you're not performing, but they built you up because they, they're afraid to have that honest conversation. So they make themselves feel better about praising you to start with. But in reality, you just deserve to be told you're not performing. <laughs> and I've done that. I've, I've told people in the respectful way, hey, this isn't coming up to speed and you need to up your game or you need to stop this behavior. But I will tell you, it's not that easy because sometimes the people appreciate, they respect being held accountable. They know that their game's up and they got caught and they, they go back. But more times than not, they just file a complaint against you. And in the government, you can do that. If you're an employee who doesn't want to work, you just file a complaint. And then um, it becomes very difficult. So I'm a little bit different for your listeners because um, the only ones that will apply to is government employees, because if you're in the private sector, you, you have more leeway to um, require people to perform or they have consequences. Not so much when you have a unionized workforce in the government. So very difficult. And I think that what you do is, even if you can't um, um, win with making that employee who's the problem, turn around their behavior or move that employee on, people in the office know you did everything you could as a leader. And their morale goes up because they know that this person is not being tolerated anymore for their behavior or their performance. So I think it's crucial for leaders to be able to address those people who are non-performing or misbehaving. And another one of the problems become, oftentimes it's somebody who's well-liked and this is why no one challenges them because they've got friends. They might've been an employee for 30 or 40 years. People who've worked with them in the past, remember them when they were young and different than they might be now 30 or 40 years later, but their image is still of this person. So if you're trying to hold them accountable, well, it must be your fault as a leader. You must be picking on this person because the person I remember 40 years ago would never have done that. <laughs> you must've made it up. <laughs> and I've had this happen to me. And it's very, very hard. So the reason that people, that leaders a lot of times don't hold employees accountable who aren't performing is because it's just so much easier for them to do nothing, to turn the blind eye, to just, to just ignore them and just give their work to somebody else, which is exactly what they want and exactly what makes the morale of the other people go down. See, and, and I'm so glad we're bringing this up because you have to, it is a, it is a um, you have to kind of, you know, um, 
negotiate that and figure that out you know it, it is it's not like a just a perfect like black and white kind of scenario it is very contextual and it's the way we approach it as well i've been in situations board member and board rooms where they called someone out and um that person because he's an a player he's like okay man i don't ever want to be called out again and he performed at a very high level the next quarter which is like really awesome but some individuals i do know like that approach would not be effective for that person because hey they need more of off that assistance and it's really just knowing your people at the end of the day is that correct sandy as well just understanding okay hey how do i how do i you know talk to that person the way that i know that's going to get the yes. best out of them it's all about emotional intelligence and so there's two um interpretations of this conversation <laughs> the one that you just put on the table which is people who are trying to make their sales quota or whatever and they've fallen short and they get called out at a board meeting then what I'm talking about, I'm not talking about those kind of people. I'm sorry if I gave that misperception. I'm talking about willfully negligent, willfully poor performing, willfully misbehaving employees who have gotten away with it. <laughs> so that's two different kinds of leadership to address looking somebody in the eye and telling them they aren't performing is the ones who are, who are trying hard and just aren't skilled. Or maybe they're not trying hard enough, but they're not... Um, willfully trying to create problems. They're just not meeting expectations. Then you've got the other kinds that are kind of, they, they, they're pretty savvy and they know they're getting away with it, right? And um, they're the hardest ones to deal with. So yeah, I agree with you. An empathetic leader seeks to meet their people where they are and learn about those people so that he or she can relate to that person. And if you lined up six people in this conversation with us it'd be six different humans motivated differently some people might need thanks and kudos other people are don't bore me with that just give me a job my satisfactions and getting the job done there's all kinds of uh, rewards that people want we see this in the military i learned early on not to um call somebody up in front of all their peers and read an award I learned to go to the person and say, hey, I've got this um, award we're going to give you for doing so well in this function. I'd like to read it in front of the whole unit so they can all see what you did. But I also know I want to ask you if that's all right. I'll write first. And there's people, most people are like, fine. There's people who are mortified about that. And you're just going to crush them if you pull them up into the center, make them stand there and all eyes are on them and you've just ruined their day. And the award is just now a reminder. It's just a, a bad thing, right? <laughs> I've had that happen. Not to me, because I learned early on to ask people what kind of recognition they wanted privately in my office with just their family or in front of the whole unit. And people choose differently. And, and that really matters as a leader, having that emotional intelligence to be able to understand those motivations. You know, I find that just so interesting because sometimes the way we interpret something may be totally something different than someone else that interprets it, right? And that's a good, you know, psychological kind of aspect behind it where it's like, okay, hey, I thought that would have been, you know, gravitos and, you know, wow, this is amazing and really you're lifting them up. But the reality is they interpreted something different. And being able, like you mentioned, that emotional IQ, really understanding, hey, those, those people, how do they, um, how do they, how do they get the most out of it? How do you engage them? Because you do have to be very uh, in you know, intelligent with, you know, and very micro with each individual um, and, and at each level. Uh, Sandy, I, I just, I appreciate this conversation so much. And I appreciate the book that you wrote and, and the interviews that you've done and the work that you've done, but also the journey that you had to go through to be able to iron yourself, sharpen yourself to such an extent where you could obviously learn these incredible skills and these incredible core values and these non-negotiables that you've held on throughout the whole career. Uh, and I think this is so, so dire in today's society and today's world where people need to understand, hey, these are these solid non-negotiables and you can rise the ranks at a very high level and stay there and exit very well, retire very well, and now impact hundreds upon millions of people um, without having to be this, this you know, um, scammy thing. And, and, and uh, Sandy, you've done that in, in your career and obviously now. And I really appreciate you being on here. Uh, Sandy, how can my audience reach out, uh, purchase your book, get more of your content, learn about what you're doing, Sandy? Oh, great. Thanks for asking. Well, you can find me at my website, www.sandrastows.com. That's got a link to my book. And I always encourage people to 
use their local bookstores. I just like to um, keep things local, but surely Amazon and, and all the, uh, anywhere the books are sold is my, my books available. And I hope that you will have your readers follow my blog. I do a, a bi-monthly leading with character blog, and that's also found on my website. I've got a blog tab. So that's that's uh, uh, something that you wanna, if you like what I do, you can see uh, every two weeks, another leadership um, vignette. Awesome, guys, those links are in the description. You can literally purchase her book on every platform, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, everything like that. So make sure you stop what you're doing. I would highly suggest it. Definitely when you're running a mid seven figure business and you wanna scale to eight and nine figure, you wanna make sure you, because again, it's all about financials, it's all about culture, but also it's about the right leaders, right? And not only just the C-suite level, but also mid-tier and all the, you know, integrating and sprinkling that throughout your whole organization. And uh, I would highly recommend getting this book for your team and for everybody else to make sure you have a very solid core value culture uh, to really help you scale that next level. And Sandy, again, I really appreciate you being on here. Those links are in the description. I always love to ask my guests before I let you go, is there any last words of wisdom that you'd like to share with our audience? Sure. I do a lot of talking with young people at the Coast Guard Academy and other colleges. And so I always leave them with my mantra. And that is be bold. That means reach high. Don't let anyone tell you you can't. And it means believe in yourself. And uh, that's the second B. Believe that you can do it. Don't let anyone tell you you can't. And then you can become the leader of character you're meant to be. So be bold, believe, and become the leader you're meant to be. That is fantastic advice. Guys, that is the author of Breaking Ice and Breaking Glass, Leading in Uncharted Waters, Vice Admiral Sandy Stowes. Guys, that is Journey with Christian Davis podcast. Until next time, be uncommon if you can. <laughs>